so hi everyone. So today I'm going to talk about uh, the topic of optimal, trans of optimal transport. Uh, so if there are any questions, uh, feel free to to to, uh, to ask. Um, and so this is joint work with uh, so Michael, uh, Sesh, and uh, my supervisor uh, Mark. Um, so we're going, we're going to talk about two problems today. Uh, the first problem is the problem of uh, computing barrier centers of uh, measures, and the second is the problem of much marginal optimal transport. So I'm going to dive uh, into this. So let's first start with like a, a motivating problem uh, here. And uh, it's uh, the problem of um, training multiple uh, agents. So uh, I, I call it multitask reinforcement learning, where we have different agents living in different environments and they need to solve different tasks. So basically, their, their task can be represented by, by a reward function. Uh, and, um, and what happens in our setting is that uh, the agents have uh, corrupted rewards. Uh, so what happens is that there are areas in the state space where they don't get rewards. And so that, that's uh, basically an issue for them to learn because uh, they, they just don't get the reward, reward signals they need uh, to actually learn. So you can see reward functions here that are corrupted. So it's just, it's just an illustration. Um, another setting is, so again, it's task RL, but in that setting, some of the agents don't get any rewards. So they don't have any reward signal and they just like basically have, they have no way to, to learn any like meaningful uh policy in the environment and uh, so the question is how do we enable like uh, uh, sharing of uh, knowledge across tasks uh in a in a sensible way and we're gonna see that the tool from optimal transport can be uh, can be useful here later so as a brief summary i'm going to talk about two problems the first one is a, a problem of averaging so how do we average probability measures um, and the second one is the problem of multi-marginal optimal transport, which is a problem of comparing a lot of measures. Uh, so I'll clarify what I mean by all this. So the tool we study today uh, is a really like probability measures. Um, and uh, we're, we study both discrete and continuous probability measures. So I'll start with describing uh, the one on the left, so discrete measures. Uh, just so very intuitively, what a discrete measure is, uh, is basically a set of points in some, in some metric space uh, with some weights assigned to, the, uh, to, to them. So here we are on R2, so to the two-dimensional space. We have points located at different, uh, uh, different places. And each of these points are weighted according to uh, the weights Wn. So W uh, is a vector, it sums to one, and uh, it, it's made of positive numbers. Um, so basically, it's an extension of a data set which allows to weight uh, uh, the points. And, uh, and this is going to be the, the object we study uh, mainly today. So the uh, first question is, how do we compare these sort of objects? Um, so there are different ways of, of doing so. Um, and uh, and they've been used like all over machine learning because like the simplest example of this object is just a data set where you know, when it has uniform weights. So just comparing data sets, like it, it sort of like a problem appears all over, all over ML. Uh, and so different like sort of approaches have been proposed. You have the area of optimal transport, which is going to be the focus today. Uh, with the Wasserstein and the Grumman Wasserstein uh, distances. Then you have the area of, uh, of kernel methods. And so the main uh, distance there uh, is uh, the MMD and its extensions uh, like the scaled MMD. And there are other distances like uh, spread across, uh, uh, across statistics, like the KL divergence, total variation, and so on. So there are a lot of ways of comparing, this, of comparing measures. And these different ways have a lot of different uh, properties. Okay, so let's start with optimal transport. Uh, and I'm going to start with the Monge formulation, which was the original formulation of, uh, of that problem uh, proposed by Monge. So in that case, we have uh, basically uh, two distributions, uh, so mu zero and mu one. And uh, the goal is to find a, a map T, which is going to transport mass from the first measure to the, to the second measure. So here we have continuous measures, but it's the same idea for discrete measures. Um, and that we want to find a map that is going to minimize the, the cost of transporting the mass from the first measure to the second measure. So just to be more concrete, we, we define the problem of computing the Wasserstein distance as finding a map T, which is a, what we call a Monge map. Uh, so it's, it, 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 it's, um, that set is a set of maps um, that basically transport mu x to mu y. Um, and we want to find the minimum of the expected cost of transporting mass. So D is a metric on the space where the measures live. And here it's the expectation under the first measure, the measure on the left mu x, the expectation of the cost of transporting mass between x, so a sample from mu x, and t of x. So you map x through t, and you see how far these two points are, and you want to minimize that, that, that expected cost. 
So that's the Wasserstein distance. And, uh, and yeah, this is the Monge formulation. So the problem of the Monge formulation is that there are a lot of cases where it's not well defined, especially when we are dealing with discrete measures. And so Kontorovich proposed a relaxation of that problem, uh, in which case, instead of a deterministic map from one measure to the other, you have a stochastic map. So that allows to basically split uh, mass of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the points. Um, and so it's defined as now finding um, a joint distribution, pi, uh, which has marginals mu x and mu y, the two measures. Um, and, uh, and the objective is to minimize the expected cost under that joint of transporting mass from, uh, from, uh, so from the first measure to the second. So you can see this as, so pi of x, y says how much mass should be moved from uh, the point x to the point y. And, uh, and this is the expected uh, cost under, under that transport plan. We call that a plan. Um, all right. So the problem is that this, this problem is very challenging. Uh, so like most approaches are uh, super cubic. And so they don't really scale well with the number of samples in the measures. Um, and so there has been like a, a different approximations that have been proposed over recent years, especially the, uh, the, the first one was with uh, Couture in 2013, which proposed to add an entropic penalty to the problem, which allows to use like a very celebrated algorithm called, called Syncorn and has like a way better uh, complex computation of complexities. The problem is that this uh, penalty introduce, introduces a bias. So it's not any more distance and there are issues with that. And so then people propose like the Syncon, uh, uh, other people propose the Syncon divergence, which debiases it and has a better uh, metric property. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an actual divergence. And uh, these uh, objects are uh, mostly used uh, in practice because they, are, they have way better computation complexities. So now we go into the kernel world. Um, there is like this other distance between uh, measures, which allows to compare measures called um, MMD. Uh, um, the maximum in discrepancy, which relies on the positive definite kernel uh, K. And the idea is that you compare uh, the expected uh, value of the kernel uh, over like joint samples from the first measure, plus the expected value of the kernel on joint samples from the second measure. You compare this sum to the cross expected kernel. So like you the, the expectation over samples from mu x, mu y of the, of the kernel between x and y. So that's like the, the MMD, um, and it has very different properties from uh, from the Wasserstein, uh, as we're going to see uh, very soon. And there is another view of uh, MMD, uh, which is based on the concept of kernel mean embeddings. So these are maps uh, from probability space to a, a reproducing kernel uh, Hilbert space on RKHS. I'm not going to go too much into the details because it's not going to be the, the focus, but the idea is you embed the probability measure uh, as a point in some RKHS. And then you define the MMD as a distance in the RKHS between the embeddings of the two measures. So that's, uh, that's, that's this distance. The problem of MMD is it doesn't work really well when you are going into high dimensional spaces, uh, especially image spaces, because uh, it's hard to set a kernel that is sensible for that space. Um, and so uh, over recent years, uh, people have been proposing uh, actually to, to learn uh, the kernel, ad uh, typically adversary. So that you can basically sort of learn better representation for the samples, which allows like uh, using uh, a classical kernel like the, the RBF with some representations f psi that are, that are learned, and this allows like having better uh, uh, training signals uh, in different like application areas. So the, and we're gonna call uh, that formation the SMMD uh, today. Okay, so now we come to the first problem we study, which is the problem of averaging measures. So the, and we call that a barycentric averaging. So the idea is like it's basically a direct extension of means of uh, on Euclidean spaces to pr to probability spaces. So the idea is you're going to try to find a measure mu, which is going to be as close as possible to a set of measures mu one to mu big P, uh, and according to some distance. So basically the idea is you have, for example, here four measures. Um, the this one is has a higher weight in the in the barycentric cost, and you want to find a measure mu so that the star here which is going to be as close as possible to all the measures. So you want to minimize the sum of distances, the weighted sum of distances between, um, be, between the bar center and all these measures. Um, and, uh, and yeah, that's basically a, a measure on a, 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 a mean of measures. And depending on what the distance D, you, we're gonna see that the bar the averaging has like very different properties. So for example, uh, when you compute the Wasserstein bar center, so when D is uh, the Wasserstein distance, what happens is you see that it's actually going to pull 
the, the, the virus center towards the mean with the highest weight. So we have four measures here, mu1 to mu4. And this measure has the highest weight, so the beta, beta p. It has the highest weight. And the, the virus center is basically going to have like sort of the same structure as, as each measure, but it's going to be pulled towards the one with the highest weight. By contrast, the MMD has what we call mixture behavior. So the virus center uh, is going to put mass on all of the four measures, but just is going to put more mass on measures that have a higher weight. And, uh, and that's like the uh, averaging behavior of MMD. And uh, I'm not going to go into the details, but the synchron divergence, so like the entropic, the debiased entropic approximation of Wasserstein uh, interpolates between these two behaviors. Uh, so yeah, that's like the formal statement, but it's not really useful. It's just like uh, basically saying that the, the Wasserstein has uh, interpolation properties, uh, whilst like the MMD has mixture properties. So like the, the MMD bar center is exactly the mixture of each me of all measures, depend uh, under assumption of the kernel. So, um, Today we're going to study like bar centers of, of general distance d, but just like uh, to, to discuss quickly the Wasserstein bar centers, these are extremely hard to compute for different reasons. Uh, the first reason is that the Wasserstein itself is really hard to uh, to, to estimate, um, and like when you uh, try to to solve a bar centric problem, you need to compute a lot of Wassersteins. So that's really costly. So what people have been uh, doing is to uh, use like the biased entropic approximation of the Wasserstein so to compute syncorn. Uh, bar center to sort of approximate Wasserstein bar centers. So that's uh, one thing. But there is another issue, which is that like most approaches, well, what they basically do is they parameterize a discrete measure. So they parameterize like a grid of points as uh, the xn's and uh, of weights, wn's, and they learn the, the weight and the, and, the, and the point, either both or like one or the other. And uh, what happens is that uh, there is a curse of dimensionality because when you go into more dimensions, you need uh, more and more and more points to represent the space well and to learn the measures, like uh, to learn the bar center sensibly. And so basically, there's this exponential curve that is, that is clear. Um, and so typically in bar center papers, what's the bar center papers, you would see like applications in R2, R3, but like you wouldn't see things in, for example, image space uh, for, for because of this curse. All right. So um, in the, the first uh, paper I'm going to discuss uh, about, we propose a, a solution to that, uh, which is based on two components, global parameterizations and structural inductive biases. So um, I'll explain what I mean by that. So basically, instead of optimizing over spaces of probability measures, uh, which is uh, typically very hard, we turn uh, the optimization into a parametric optimization over spaces of generative models. Um, so basically, instead of parameterizing like the atoms of, of, a, of a measure, so like the Xn and Wn's, we parameterize a global model, G theta, uh, which is um, basically going to assign um, a mass uh, sort of continuously depending on the on, on row. Uh, and it's it, like avoids us having to like parameterize like each single point. So the idea here is you, you write P theta as a push forward of row through G theta. What I mean by that is that to sample from P theta, what you do is you sample a sing, uh, uh, you sample the sample zi from rho, and then you compute g theta of zi, and that gives you a sample from p theta. So it's it's very uh, uh, similar to what you do in implicit generative modeling, like all the sort of GAN, GAN approaches. That, that's exactly what you do, and you parameterize basically p theta in that way. And um, what this allows again is not to have to parameterize each point. So it's a global parameterization. So uh, importantly, doing that allows to enforce inductive biases in the in the in the in the in the solution we're trying to uh, to to uh, to find, um, and that allows scaling with high dimension uh, in the in high dimensions because if we have we know we have structural knowledge on the on the optimum on the bar center, then we can enforce this and scale with dimensions. So it's not basically a miracle solution um, that alleviates like, the curse of dimensionality in all cases. It's just that it allows when there is structural knowledge that is known to uh, to 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 help uh, optimization. Um, and uh, so, for example, to, to give you a few examples, let's say we want to compute the Wasserstein bar center of Gaussians, which we know is a Gaussian. What we can do is parameterize rho as being an, a unit Gaussian, and to learn the mean and the covariance of a, of the of, of a Gaussian. Um, and so, basically, g theta is just going to be a g, g theta push forward rho is just to be a, going to be a Gaussian with mean m and covariance s, and we learn m and s. And so, instead of learning single points, we learn the mean and the covariance of of, uh, of the bar center. Uh, let's say now another example, which we're going to see later. We have an, uh, we want to compute the bar center of ellipses, uh, and we know uh, 
because it's been uh, well studied in a lot of bar center papers that the bar stuff ellipses is going to be an ellipse. What we can do is parameterize an ellipse and learn the center and the axis, basically. And, uh, and, uh, and, and again, that allows uh, having a global parameterization instead of a local one. Um, a third example is that now we want to compute the bar center in image space. So we have measures over images. Um, a good intuitive bias for images is uh, CNNs. So what we can do is we can parameterize Gigita as a CNN. A row is going to be, for example, a unit Gaussian, that's a latent measure. And we can learn the parameters of, of that CNN. And it's going to learn to generate images that are, uh, that are distributed according to the optimal bar center. Uh, how it works in practice is, so we, we, as I said, we turned the problem into a parametric optimization. So we learn the parameters of the model Gigita. Um, and the loss is just the sum, weighted sum, uh, according to BP, of distances between the, the generative model and each of the mu p's, the different measures. And we can solve that by uh, st stochastic gradient descent on uh, theta. So there are a lot of special cases of uh, what we propose here. Uh, mainly first, all the, uh, like as is most GAN approaches, um, these are special cases of what we propose in the case where p equals one. We can see here when p equals one, we just minimize the distance between a GAN and a, a new uh, a measure. So that's like the, or it recovers like most GAN settings, like MMD GAN, Wasserstein GAN, and so on. Then another uh, special case uh, is Rigolet et al., which uh, do what uh, sort of what we do in the case of quotients. So they basically uh, um, learn the mean and covariance of uh, of uh, of the bar center of uh, quotients uh, using SGD. And uh, there is a third example, which is Su et al. 2019, which train P Wasserstein GANs on different subsets of the same data uh, with the goal of uh, doing parallelization. And then there uh, they they have like a sort of like bar center of Wasserstein GANs, but it's more like training a single GAN because it's you're, you're targeting a single uh, the, sa the same data distribution basically. Okay, so I'm not going to go too much into the details uh, of the theory, but we prove smoothness. Uh, properties of uh, different distances, and more importantly, local convergence of our algorithm for uh, under assumptions on the distance, uh, smoothness assumptions. Uh, so for example, we, we prove its convergence when the distance is uh, the, the synchron divergence, when it's uh, MMD or the MMD with, uh, with the journal. So now uh, we're going to uh, experiment. So I'm just going to uh, try to show the benefits of having global parameterizations and inductive biases being uh, enforced. And I'm also going to discuss cases where um, not enforcing the right inductive biases can be uh, detrimental to learning. Um, and so basically, it's uh, I show that really like uh, it's it's not a miracle solution; it's just a, a solution that allows to scale with high dimensions when we know uh, sensible inductive biases. But in practice, it, we often uh, know good in inductive biases for our problems. Like for example, in image space, we we know that CNNs are going to be good uh, inductive biases. So first here, we compute the bar center of um, uh, nested ellipses. So each of these squares are a measure on R2, and it's uh, just a nested ellipse. These are discrete measures. And uh, it's well known that the bar center of these nested ellipses is also a nested ellipse um, with like a nice uh, smooth, like, uh, smooth circles that are nested. Uh, so here, what we do is we parameterize our model as an MLP. So, uh, 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 multi-layer perce perceptron, so Gita is, is an MLP, and rho is a Gaussian. So we don't enforce like strong inductive biases on, on what's the optimal solution of the problem. And we learn using uh, the objective that I've described. And we see that we recover the expected solution, which is a nested ellipse um, in, with a nice shape. So here, uh, we now uh, enforce like more explicitly inductive biases, uh, which means that we parameterize two nested ellipses. Um, and we learn the centers and the axis sizes of these two nested ellipses. And we see that we recover the, the right solution and it's, uh, it, it's also slightly better. And the important thing is that both these parameterizations are global. So for example, here is going to put mass on a, an entire circle and so on, on, on the two ellipses. It's not putting mass at discrete locations. Um, and here we compare to uh, the algorithm from uh, uh, Louise et al, uh, which, um, uh, is a free support approach. So it, what I mean by that is that it uh, learns, uh, uh, it adds basically points recursive, recursively at each iteration. You add a new point to to, to the to the bar center, and so you at each at each uh, step you need to optimize to find the next point to add to, to the measure. So it has better global convergence guarantees because it's a, 
proper optimization on spaces of measure. The problem is that each, um, it, each of these situation of, or you need to add points are uh, slow because you need to solve a uh, complicated non-convex problem. And, uh, and so the problem is that it, it takes time to reach a good solution. So although it has better global convergence coherences, uh, in practice, it, is, uh, it, it doesn't scale uh, as well. Um, um, yeah, so that's one point. So now we, we study, uh, we do a quantitative study on uh, computing bar centers of Gaussian. So we study both Syncorn and uh, MMD bar centers. Uh, so here we are on, in R2, so just two dimensions. And we see that, enforce, so we, we consider two parameterizations of uh, the bar center. One which enforces explicit inductive biases. It's a Gaussian parameterization of the bar center, and we just learned the mean and the covariance. Uh, and one where it's an MLP, so it's, it's, it's less explicit. We, ju we just parameterize the GT tab being an MLP and the latent measure being uh, a Gaussian. Um, and we see that enforcing inclusive inductive biases uh, allow learning faster and reaching better solutions. Uh, but still, the MLP is still a, a relatively good inductive basis for learning uh, uh, a single uh, Gaussian. Um, and uh, the algorithm for Louis et al. will eventually uh, uh, maybe reach a better solution, but it's it's slower because of needing to solve this like little non-convex optimization problems. Um, now we go into higher dimensions. Uh, we go into five, uh, d equals 5, 20, and 50. And we consider both the Gaussian and MLP parameterization. This is, again, synchron bar centers. And we actually see that the MLP is indeed a very good inductive IS for learning Gaussians because it's, uh, it recovers uh, real good solutions even in, in high dimension and solutions that are close to uh, the Gaussian parameterization. Always slightly worse, but still, uh, still pretty good. And that's because uh, it's a good inductive, inductive bias for learning like uh, smooth and, 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 and continuous data. Uh, by contrast, now we study MMD bar centers. Um, and uh, in that case, uh, the bar center of Gaussians uh, with respect to MMD is a mixture of Gaussians. It, it's exactly the mixture of these Gaussians. And what happened is that MLPs are actually not good in inductive biases for learning mixtures. So that's been also well studied in the implicit generative modeling uh, literature. It's really hard because uh, you're going to have like, a, uh, it, it's hard to like sort of split mass across like the different modes uh, because of continuity and smoothness. And uh, so we see that uh, actually it's not going to reach as good solutions as what I call like ground truth solutions. Because here's this uh, parameterization, what I call mixture, is we're actually parameterizing mixture of Gaussians and we learn the mean and the covariances of each of the Gaussians. Um, and uh, we see that it reaches much better solutions. Uh, and so basically this is all to make the point that it's really important to enforce the right inductive biases. It'll, if so, it allows to scale to very high dimensions, which like previous algorithms could under risk scale too. But it's really important to enforce the right inductive biases. We also go into image space. Um, and uh, what we uh, see here is the we, we try to compute the bar center of uh, MNIST data sets. So each measure is the data set of uh, all the digits of that uh, of that single digit. So from below here, we compute the bar center of MNIST zeros and MNIST ones. So uh, each measure is like a, is a, a data set of one digit. And we see here, this is a syncorn and here it's MMD bar center, which is, which is we see that the bar center in image space has very different properties as we expect. So to explain what happens in the syncorn case, it's um, so each so just so each of these samples is a single sample from the bar center. Each image is, is a sample from the bar center. And so what it's doing is it's sort of sampling a zero and a one that are very similar and it's interpolating between them. So you can see that you never have like a very small one with a very big zero crossing it or the contrary. It's always like nicely uh, going into it. Uh, in, in, into each other, and um, and that's really like uh, the interpolate expected from the interpolation properties of uh, of the of the Wasserstein. It's like it's, if it's sampling a, a close zero and a one and, and like uh, averaging them. In uh, the um, MMD case, it's very different. We see that actually it has a, the expected mixture properties, where it's basically you're, you're basically going to get ones and zeros. Um, so basically, samples from each of the measures. We see that the quality is not great of the samples in the MMD case, which is linked to the problem I discussed earlier, which is that it's hard to set good kernels uh, in the MMD case to, uh, to work on image space. And so we also study optimized MMD bar centers, which are not MMD bar centers, so they are not, not exactly mixtures. We don't have the exact same theorem that we, we had uh, earlier. But we see that in practice, it actually has the same behavior. So in this experiment, we actually compute the bar center of 10 measures. So it's basically each, each of these 10 measures is like the data set of a single digit. So you have 
a, a measure which is all of the zeros, a measure which is all of the ones, all of the twos, and so on. And we compute the bar center of these 10 measures, and we see that yeah, it, it's basically going to give pulse for each of the digits, and, and they are like much better shaped because optimized MMD works better on image space. And we do the same for Celebar. Uh, and here we are in a, a 164 by 164 by three dimensions. Uh, so it's very high dimensional. And uh, and here uh, we compute the bar center of Celebar uh, male and Celebar females at the two measures. And we see that it's going to generate from the two classes. Um, and so again, it's basically here enforcing the right inductive basis, like for example, here using CNNs as generative models, uh, allow us to scale the computation of bar centers to uh, massively high dimensions by comparison with previous algorithms that worked in like R2 and R3 mainly. Um, so yeah, that was for uh, bar centric averaging. So if there are any questions, please ask. The only thing is I can't see messages because I'm sharing my screen. So if there are any questions, uh, feel free to just uh, uh, talk. Um, as I'm going to jump into another problem, which is the problem of uh, multi-marginal optimal transport. Uh, so I'll just give a quick reminder on what's uh, Mon transport. So we discussed this earlier, but basically again, we're trying to find a map, a deterministic map T from a measure mu X to a measure mu Y, which is going to transport so all the mass from mu X to mu Y, and which minimizes a cost of transport. Uh, so that, that's basically the, the expected squared distance between uh, samples X from the first measure and sample T of X, uh, which is basically mapping X to, uh, towards like mu Y. Um, so that's most transport. And now I'll discuss uh, it's a bit more complicated, the, the multi-marginal extension of Monge transport. Um, in which case, basically now, instead of having just one map from one measure to the other, we're going to have P minus one maps. So we have uh, P measures, mu one to mu P. Um, and we want to find p minus one maps. So each of these maps map from the first measure mu one to the pth measure mu p, right? Uh, so just as a simple case, when you have just two measures, you only have one map, which maps mu one to mu two. Um, and so we want to minimize the expect uh, expected uh, multi-marginal cost, so I expect what I mean, of transporting mass from mu one to each of the measures. So um, just to explain the structure of these costs, what this is saying is that so like map each point, uh, map, map, map X from mu one towards like each of the measures, so like through the maps TP. Um, and then you have like joint samples, so like uh, X1 to XP from each of the measures. And the cost is basically, it's, it's looking at how far each point is from the other X1 to XPs. Um, and, uh, and so basically it's trying to find a map which is going to uh, map mu1 to uh, each of the measures so that when you map a single sample from mu1 to each of the measures uh, the transported samples are going to be close to each other that's like the, that's what this roughly means and um, and yes that's the problem of inch marginal monch transport problem is that it's really really hard to solve uh, so like there is also the contour of each uh, variation which instead of deterministic maps try to find a joint uh, distributions over uh, these p measures with like p marginals um, but all of these problems like don't really have solutions at scale. Uh, so for example, there, are, there is an extension of the syncon algorithm uh, for pairwise measures to uh, the multi-marginal setting. The problem is that each of the iteration of the algorithms have complexity O of n to the power of p. So for example, let's say we have uh, three measures. We can go to maybe to, to a few thousand samples, or maybe 10,000 samples. But if we have uh, five measures, right? We, we, we can't go over like a few hundred samples. And so if you have like uh, six measures and yeah, we, we are doomed, we can't really like solve the problem. So this problem is really, really intractable. And, uh, and we're going to, uh, I'm going to discuss today uh, what we proposed uh, in a recent paper, uh, which allows scaling um, a, a very like, scalable approach to multi-marginal transport. Okay, so uh, we follow the line of research uh, of sliced optimal transport. And how it works is we first find uh, a closed form formula for the problem in one dimension. So we have measures on R with uniform weights uh, and the same number of atoms. And uh, we, for this uh, setting, we solve uh, that problem in closed form. And uh, that's like the formula here. And the impo important thing is that in that setting, the complexity for computing the, the, this multi-marginal uh, distance is O of P n log n. So it's uh, n log n in the number of samples, n in the number of samples, and P is the number of measures. 
so it's linear in the number of measures and it's n log n in the number of samples. So this is um, uh, very highly scalable. And uh, it, it's also, uh, so like the complexity in the pairwise case, so like the classical uh, optimal transport setting, the complexity is n log n. So here we are just like linearly uh, uh, worse than this, where p n log n, but that's, that's really fine. It allows to scale to very large measures. Um, and so yeah, we, we get this, uh, we derive this formula in the paper. Um, but the problem is that these approaches don't scale, like the, the approaches to uh, prove these sort of results don't uh, extend to higher dimensions. So the reason for that is, um, is that uh, basically we rely on, uh, on, on sorting here. So like basically the computing this distance uh, amounts to sorting each of the measures and then like computing this, this sum. Um, the problem is that like, it's, it's not clear how to do that in, in higher than dimensions than R because like, there is not a clear notion of what it means to, to sort. Um, so this doesn't extend directly to higher dimensions. And so what uh, everyone has been doing in the slice literature is to define new uh, distances. Um, and so what we basically do is we define the slice multi marginal Wasserstein uh, squared as an expectation over random projections. So it's like these titas uh, of multi marginal Wasserstein between projected measures. So what this means is that you sample a tita, which is just a projection um, uh, on R to R you project each of the, all the samples of e all of the measures uh, to R um, with this linear projection X theta. And then we have P measures which live on R and we, we, uh, we have range over random projections is expected much marginal Wasserstein squared. Um, and so that allows to have a, a distance uh, well-defined on uh, R D where D can be uh, potentially very large, but still to have good computational complexities. So uh, to clarify, we compute this expectation over random projection. We estimate it by Monte Carlo estimation. So we just sample K projections and average this multi marginal wash time squared. And the complexity in RD uh, is K P N log N, where K is the number of projections, P is the number of measures, and N log N is the number of samples. Uh, so that's also like uh, very highly scalable. We are also, again, linear in the number of projections, linear in the number of uh, measures, and N log N is the number of samples. Um, and importantly, like also it's not uh, like when, when you define a slice distance, it's not necessarily approximating or estimating the, the true distance. Uh, we prove that it has a very, it is very well behaved and has nice metric properties uh, in what follows. So what we start is we prove that it has what we call generalized metric properties. So first on R, so we first study the multi-marginal Wasserstein and we show it's a generalized metric. So what this means is that um, it is always positive um, if it's zero, then it means that all the measures, so P measures are equal. If, uh, if it is also like invariant under uh, permutations of the measure, so that's like the analog, analog of um, the symmetry property of metrics. So under any permutation of the, of the, of the measures, it is, uh, it is uh, equal. And it follows uh, the, what, uh, a generalized triangle inequality, which basically generalizes a triangle inequality to the case where we have P measures. Because I should say it's under the assumption that the cost structure uh, is uniform. So the, the weight assigned to each of the measure is uniform. Um, and we actually also prove that the slice version of that, so the extensions to higher dimensions, we prove that it, all, it preserves metric properties. So it also has generalized metric properties. And so it's, it's well behaved in, in higher dimensions too. All right, so now we are gonna go into uh, applications. And first we'll do a quick like empirical analysis just to sh show the massive scalability of the distance. Um, so we deal with problems where we have, uh, for example, like even 20 measures and here 10 million samples. And so computing the slice multi marginal Wasserstein squared with so 10 million samples, 20 measures takes only like roughly eight, sec eight seconds. So that's, uh, that's re 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 like pretty fast. Uh, by comparison with like uh, previous approaches, which dealt with like three, four measures and like hundreds of samples and which would take like much more time. Um, so the other thing is here we, uh, show that it's uh, indeed linear in the number of measures. Uh, so here we go uh, to up to uh, 10,000 measures and uh, no, so, um, actually 2,000 measures, sorry, and uh, up to 50,000 samples. And so for 50,000 samples, 2,000 measures, it takes, uh, yes, like six seconds. So that's also um, quite fast. Um, and, uh, and here we study the impact of the number of projections on the estimation so because we do Monte Carlo estimation, so on the estimation of the slice multi-marginal distance. 
And we see that uh, sort of as expected also when we go into higher dimensions, it needs more projection for the variance to in the estimation to reduce. Um, yeah, so that's for the empirical analysis. Now we're gonna go into applications. So the first one, uh, it's maybe not the uh, most interesting application, but it's pretty informative on what the properties of this slice distance that we propose. And uh, we show that it's uh, intimately linked to bar center of measures. Um, so, um, what we do here first is barocentric averaging, similarly to what we did before. The only difference is we have a different objective. Now our objective is to find a measure mu, which is as close as possible to mu one to mu p according to the slice multimarginal distance. Uh, so this distance is a distance between now p plus one measures, and we try to find a mu which is as close as possible to all the other ones. Um, before, what, when we were doing barocentric averaging, what we're doing is we're trying to find a mu that is as good as possible according to the weighted sum of distances of washer's time. Um, and what we prove in the paper is actually that uh, doing this minimization of the slice multimarginal washer's time squared with respect to mu is actually exactly equivalent to doing the minimization of the bar center problem when the distance is the slice washer's time squared. So it's like just the slice washer's time, uh, the, the pairwise case of the, the slice of slice OT. Um, and so we prove this connection and we also have a, like empirical results like showing that we basically get roughly the same solution when solving these two problems on the earlier problem of, of nested ellipses. So basically it's, it's just to say that the slice multimarginal washer stein distance that we propose has uh, properties that are really similar to uh, the bar centers. And that's because of the cost structure that we study in the, in the paper. We don't study general cost structures. It's really, the, uh, it's a cost structure that has been a lot studied. It's, it's called, it's, it's from, the original paper of uh, Aguirre, uh, uh, Aguirre and Carlier. And, uh, um, and yeah, we, we studied that explicitly. All right, so now we go into a, a setting which I think is more interesting, which is the setting of multitask uh, regularization. So what we do here is uh, we solve problems on spaces, of, multitask problems on spaces of measures. Uh, and so basically we try to find a measure, that, uh, like, sorry, P measures that are close to uh, p other measures, mu p's, according to some loss. Um, and we add a regularizer, uh, so which enforces that the, the measures that we learn, the new one to mu p, need to be closed in some sense. So I, I'll clarify what I mean by that and like concrete instantiations. But the idea is just to add this regularizer so that you can share knowledge and structure across tasks. Um, yeah. Right. So now, multi-task um, density estimation, that's one of the applications of that framework. So in that setting, what we have, sorry, is p measures mu p, um, and we want, and, and let's say there are discrete measures with like a low amount of samples. We want to find models mu p, so other measures, which are going to be close to this. Let's say, for example, they can be also be continuous, um, which are going to be close to it. So like learn what these, these densities, um, uh, but we are going to regularize by adding our regularizer to so the slice multimarginal washer stein distance, which enforces that the learned model need to be closed in some sense and in the sense of the slice multimarginal distance. Um, and that's uh, interesting in settings where the tasks are, for example, corrupted. So let's say the new, new P, we're gonna see that are corrupted, then you can share structure, which will help like finding like sensible solution. Um, okay, so let's, let's go into a concrete example. So in here, we have multiple density estimation tasks. So we have um, uh, multiple measures here, which are nested ellipses, and these are uh, all corrupted. So in or orange, it's like the, the new piece of the measure, and in blue, it's like the models that we learn. So here, we don't have any regularization. And so what we see is that we, the models learned just recover the data, the corrupted data, and so they are, and the models are then like also corrupted. So you can see that there are holes too. And then we, try adding a bit of regularization with the slice multimarginal distance, which allows to share structure. So it, and, and the shared structure is that all these things are nested ellipses, also corrupted. And what we see is it basically fills the holes. So you can see that basically now all of these things are nested ellipses, but they still preserve the, the, the sort of like task specific information. Like for example, the orientation, you can see here like this measure is oriented diagonally and you can see that the solution preserves, but is a nested ellipse and, uh, and yeah. And, and here, what we do is we add a very, very large regularization. So there is like this gamma parameter, we set it to very large, which enforces that basically the main thing you need to focus on is to make like sort of uniform solutions. And we see that basically, yeah, all the solutions are going to be uniform. They are really close to the bar center that we've seen earlier. And, uh, and so they're not good individual solutions uh, because the regularization is too high. 
So to show this like sort of more quantitatively, we plot uh, the multitask uh, loss, which is basically um, which is basically like uh, estimating how uh, good each of the models are to learn the ground truth uncorrupted ellipses, nested ellipses. And we see that, and, and we plot that against the regularizer uh, coefficient. And so what we see is that as the regularization grows, the loss um, decreases a lot because it's going to basically find like, it, it, like the, the models turn into nested ellipses as expected and as expected by the ground truth. Uh, and are still good solutions because they preserve like orientations and so on. And we see that then as it becomes too large, the solutions become uniform. Uh, and so as expected, the loss grows back again. Um, so yeah, that's something more quantitative on, on, what's, on what's happening. Uh, and we study another setting, uh, which again allows to share knowledge across tasks. Um, and it's the setting of multitask RL that I've discussed earlier. So in that case, we have um, um, multiple agents um, living in different environments, which are structurally related. So basically like sharing knowledge across this uh, task makes sense. Um, and uh, we're gonna have that for some agents, the reward function is corrupted, for example, or they don't even have get any reward from their environment and can't learn. Um, in our setting, what we do is we have a reward function. So each of the agents have a reward function which is a sum of two things. The this first thing is the canonical reward of the environment. It's basically uh, the normal reward it would get uh, for the normal task, the canonical task in the environment. So that's like what you have in no normal single task uh, RL. Um, and this term is a multitask reward, which is not based on, the, uh, on, on like rewards coming from the environment. It's just looking at how uh, close sort of the, the, the states of the agent P are to the states of the other agents. Um, and basically what we do is that this thing is set uh, that way. And that term comes from the slice multimarginal Wasserstein objective as I'm going to show uh, uh, the next slide. And so what this means is that you have one term which is like the classical rule of environment and one term which allows tasks. Um, and let's say the rewards are corrupted so that this term is corrupted or is even set to zero always uh, for some of the agents, then this agent can still learn because it's going to be able to get information from the other agents that have rewards. All right. So we optimize this objective, which is basically the sum across tasks. So P, P is each task, sum over time, each uh, time in the environment. And this is a reward function we've seen before. And this is like the state of the PIF agent at time t. And we minimize that, uh, we, uh, we optimize that with respect to each policy. So we learn a policy for each of each agent. And we see that if this F function is minus Y, we show that actually what this amounts to do is to have the classical RL objectives. That's one, the expected uh, total sum of uh, rewards. And we uh, and it's adding a, reg a regularizer, which is the size multimarginal water stein between mu1 to mu p where mu1 to mu p are the trajectories of each agent and that basically like enforces that the policies learned by each of the agents have to be structurally related it basically says this term says that the trajectories of each agent have to be structurally related and so that's what happens when you set this second reward function to this and f to minus uh, x so f of x to minus x and so now let's have a concrete application uh, we consider five tasks. Uh, these are pendulum tasks. It's a very, very classical like a, a task arising from optimal control. And uh, these tasks are all obviously structurally related because they are all pendulum tasks. Um, but they have slightly different dynamics. So like we vary the gravity, they have different gravities. And more importantly, we uh, also can corrupt the rewards. So when, we, when I'm going to, we're going to talk about corrupted settings, it means that two out of five of the agents don't get any reward. So basically if they are trained alone, and if we set this, we don't to zero, so gamma to zero, so they just get canonical rewards, they just get zero re re rewards and they can't learn. So what happens now in that setting is that, um, basically that's like the corrupted setting with no regularization, so gamma equals zero. We can see that basically only three out of five agents learn. And so we get like to three out of five, three fifths of, what we uh, of the, the of the loss we can reach when we are in the uncorrupted setting so all agents get rewards they all learn to solve their tasks 
pretty efficiently. And so the five agents learn to solve their task. Um, and so, yeah, obviously we want to try to find a way of, of like sort of saving these two agents that don't get rewards and allowing them to learn even though they don't get rewards from the environment. And so we consider that setting. And so it's the green curve. It's like corrupted rewards. So two agents don't get rewards, but we add regularization and gamma is equal to one. Um, and so in that case, what happens agents are able to learn, even though two out of five don't get any rewards in our environment, and even though uh, the tasks are still slightly different, there are, there are different qualities. So it just shows that basically the, the slice with some general Washerstein regularizer allows to share like really structural knowledge on, on what's like the optimal solution. And so in that case, for example, like the, it, it allows sharing what the structure of like the trajectory of an agent solving a function of a task. And based on that, it's able to like sort of like help the agents that don't have rewards to learn uh, in the environment to solve a task. And so what we see on this curve for the green case is that first, each of the agents that get rewards learn, and then, and, and the other don't, because like, and, and then at some point you see that so when like the three agents learn, so that's the point where like, if you don't have regularization, you get here. Um, at this point here, then um, the other agents, the ones that don't have rewards, can now use the other agents that have rewards and learn the sensible policy to uh, find a way of solving the task. And, and then like say, this, the two remaining agents learn. Uh, so basically like this regularization allow all agents to learn even those that don't get rewards. So you just need like a few of the agents to have rewards uh, to, to like sort of like uh, pull all the other agents towards good uh, policies. Right. So as um, today we propose two methods uh, for solving two different problems in optimal transport. The first one was how do we average probability measures in high dimensions? And uh, we discussed the fact that it's a really hard problem. There is like no miracle solution, uh, but all previous approaches didn't scale. And what we show is that if we have structural knowledge on the, on, the, on the solution, what we can do is have a global parameterization and enforce selective biases through this global parameterization. Uh, and we propose as an algorithm, we prove local convergence of the algorithm under assumptions of the distance. But uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, pretty general and pretty uh, scalable with the dimensions. Um, and uh, and we also proposed a solution to uh, uh, another problem, which is uh, the problem of multi-marginal optimal transport, which allows defining distances between multiple measures, which have application in uh, uh, multitask learning, as we've seen. Um, and uh, it's uh, yeah, a, a very highly scalable and has a good generalized metric properties. Um, yeah, so that's the end. Thanks a lot for uh, for listening. And if there are any questions, uh, it will be a pleasure.